today we're, we're speaking about worship today. We talked about it last week, and uh, this week is very much a, a continuation of that. Uh, last week we kind of talked about what, what it is and what it means to use it, and today we're speaking to, into the situations that you're going through in your life right now. Like, what, what could worship in your life do for you? What could worship do better for you? How could worship help you in your life right now? But in order to unpack that, in order to talk about that, I want to start us off right into Scripture. Normally I like to uh, talk a few, about a few other things, but today I just want to go right into it. We're going to go into Psalm 137, 1 through 4. And what I want to tell you about this before we read it, before we get into this, is this is about the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel had been in their city, Jerusalem. If you're around the Old Testament, you'll start to see some themes that come up. You'll hear Israel. You'll, you'll hear Judah. You will hear uh, uh, Jerusalem as uh, you know David's city, the chosen city. You'll hear things like about the temple and that sort of thing. And so Israel is in their city, the city of Jerusalem. That's their home. That's where things are, are warm and welcome. That's where they belong. And they don't stay there because someone comes in and takes them out of Jerusalem. They become captives. So someone comes in and lays siege to the city. And they remove them from their home. And now they're taken to a different home. And so the scripture here in in Psalm 137, this picks up in that moment where they've been pulled out of their home of Jerusalem. And they're now headed towards a new home, which is in Jerusalem. Babylon. So let's take a snapshot of that moment there. So by the rivers of Babylon, there we captives, and because this is Psalm, this is a, a, a lament here, and there, this is the Israelites speaking. In fact, this is written in past tense, so this is a, a lament as they're remembering this moment. So they have been through this moment, and now they're writing about the moment that they have been through. And so by the rivers of Babylon, there we We captives, we sat down and we wept. When we remembered Zion, the city that God imprinted on our hearts, that's Jerusalem. And on the willow trees in the midst of Babylon, we hung our harps. And why is a harp significant in this? See, in Jerusalem, when they were there, they had their harps and they sang their praise and they sang their worship. And they went to the temple and in the temple they worshiped God. And when they worshiped God, they did throw through singing, and they did so through playing. Now those harps that were with them as a vehicle of worship in the temple now have been strapped on their back as they've been walking from Jerusalem into Babylon. And now it's come off the back, and it's being hung in a tree. So we're going to find that they don't have a need for the harp. They don't want to see the harp. They don't want to touch the harp. They don't want anything to do with it. Probably because... It's associated with so much pain and so much just heartbreak and and heartache. And so they hang their harps in the tree, in the willow trees by Babylon. And then for there, they who took us captive, so their captors, they demanded of them a song with words. So this is the, the Babylonians saying, come on Israel, sing. Come on Israelites, let's hear your worship songs. They're mocking them here. This is not a, we want what you have. This is not a, we heard your band on Tuesday night, and we'd like to hear you guys again today. This is a a mocking. This is mean. This is them trying to tear Israel down to remind them that they are no longer in their place. They no longer have access to their city. And so they say, sing. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then Israel responds, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange and foreign land? See, it's too much pain to sing a worship song that they used to sing. It's too much pain to do that. They just, how can we do that? It's not in them. You guys ever tried to walk into a party and pretend that you're okay? And you know you're not selling it. You know everyone around you knows that you're not selling it. Everyone can tell that you're not okay. You know, I, I think Israel was saying, like, we, we can't even make, you know, we can't. We can't make this up here. We're just not okay. And so Israel, they hang their harps. Israel hangs the harp. Now, what it took for Israel to hang their harps was the realization 
that their worship no longer mattered or their worship no longer counted. What it took for them to set their instrument of worship in the tree was for them to come to the realization that their hurt and their pain was now overriding what used to be a joy and a, and a desire for worship. So that joy and that desire is dead because they have been taken captive and they don't have their temple. And so now they've hung their harp. So for us, when I take Israel out of the situation and I put you and me in there, what does it take for someone to steal our song? What would it take for someone to get you to hang your harp? See, what's happened with, with Israel, like I said, they used to play the harp and sing the song and play worship, and their songs were, were well known, just like ours are here. You guys know our worship songs that the Babylonians even knew. Hey, sing one of those that you've got. And they were taken from that place. So you hear us, all right? Maybe there's a point in your life, maybe you've not experienced it, but hopefully you have, where you've felt a joy, you've felt an inspiration to sing, to worship to God, where you, where you have felt that you had a connection in your worship with God, where you felt that, that, that you were, it was a two-way street. It wasn't just you screaming at the ceiling and the ceiling bouncing your words back down to you, that you were really talking with God. God was really talking with you. And if you're not a Christian, if you don't understand what I'm saying, like that, that's okay. There's this thing called prayer. We talk to God and God talks back. But sometimes we don't, we don't feel that God is talking back. And sometimes things happen in our life that take us from, I used to be in the temple and now I'm down by the river hanging my harp. And that usually comes through change when circumstances change. See, when you go from everything being secure and known and good to now you go to a place of everything being a mystery, of being unsecure, of not knowing when the paycheck is going to come, if it's going to come, of not knowing is that debit order going to come off on time, is it going to come off late, not knowing is God hearing my prayers because I'm not feeling Him, I, He's not helping me, my situation's not changing. See, when things become uncertain, when they go from certainty to uncertainty, when they go from known to mystery, then we start to come undone a little bit. And we start to lose our song, our worship song. And then when we get to a really low point, when we say that my pain, my hurt, is now overriding my desire or my hope to enter into worship with God, then I'm just going to hang my harp. See, what we are experiencing here, both in Israel and in you, is, is this. It's not complicated. So Israel was a nation that God had loved and God had blessed. And he told them, if you worship me, then I will bless you. And Israel stopped worshiping God. In fact, they started worshiping other gods in God's temple. And that made God a bit angry, made God a bit upset. He's a jealous God. And what God is saying by that is he's saying, can I not just be enough for you? Can it just be me? Can I be enough? And Israel was saying, yes, for a while, but then no. We want this, and we want to add this, and we want to worship this idol and do this thing. And what happened there is they started to separate from God. They started to lose their worship. They started to lose their song. And when they did, it made it easy to hang the harp. See, in our lives, you and me, us right here, worship is a powerful, powerful tool. But what we don't know about it, that someone does know about it, is that worship is an incredibly powerful weapon. And in fact, who does know about it is this guy called the devil. See, worship is a weapon, and the devil wants to keep you from using it. Now, here's where I want to kind of talk about God and the devil a little bit here. Some people get squeamish when we say the word uh, devil, and then I thought, well, I'll have everyone say devil, and then I thought someone, a new person, is going to hear us chanting devil, devil, you know. <laughs> so I, I thought, because, you know, you make a word familiar by saying it over and over again, you know, and so it's like devil, de you know, and I thought, oh, that's going to be weird, so... Now, we're not, we don't want to do that, but I, I want to break the ice on, the word, on this word devil and Satan and on this battle 
this battle that we all go through and that we're all up against. So here's the deal. God wants you, and he sent his son to die on the cross for you because he loves you. Satan, who used to sit in heaven with God as an archangel, as an angel in heaven, and in Isaiah and Ezekiel, it actually talks about how Satan, how Lucifer giver of light, the morning light, how he had instruments that were attached to him. And, and theologians have said that, yeah, you know what? There's good evidence that he would have had something to do with worship in heaven. I don't want to tell you necessarily that he was heaven's worship leader. I don't know that heaven had a worship leader. But what I do know is that Lucifer was set apart, and he was special, and he had something to do with leading worship. He had something to do with with uh, being a part of worship in heaven. And he was in a position of influence. That's why when he was cast out because of his pride, a whole bunch of angels went with him. So Lucifer understands the power of worship to the point that he tried to use it to steal from God what was only God's. We only worship one God. Lucifer tried to steal it and God cast him out. Now when Satan left heaven and he came down to earth, he did not forget the weapon that is worship. See, it's one thing for me to say, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes trying to tell you how great worship is. But actually, what I want to spend some time doing is trying to get you to understand how much the devil doesn't want you to know how great worship is. Because he understands it. And he wants to keep you from understanding it. And that's not weird. That's not hokey. That's just real life. There is this thing called the devil, and he does not want you to know about the weapon of worship. Now, I don't want anyone to get afraid, you know, or be afraid of that. Like, you know, what happens? Is the devil after me? You know, is he running behind me? You know, if your electricity goes off in your house, it's not the devil. You probably didn't pay the meter, right? (laughs) We don't want to over-spiritualize things right here. So, if you're immediately, if your head's racing and you're going, you know, when I pulled my socks out of the drawer, both of them were left-footed. What does that mean? You know, well, you know, hold one, turn in three circles and slap the wall with the other and you're fine. That's, I don't want to, we're not here to over, don't over spiritualize things. In fact, I'll just give you a bit of a heads up here. Here's the greatest thing that the devil would want you, that he tries to do in tricking you and and trying to sway you from worshiping God. He wants you to never question anything. So if you feel like the boat's being rocked spiritually, if you start wondering Oh, I wonder if that's God. I wonder if that's God. Well, it's not the devil. Because what the devil would tell you is you're all good, man. Don't think or wonder anything. You just stay cruising down this road and then he'll gradually pull you off to the side somewhere else. So don't be afraid of the devil. Because See, we, ha- we have this thing uh, that comes with the weapon that is worship. And that weapon is, is well, it's, it's Jesus. You know how, you know how um, much authority that we have? Later in the service, we're going to sing a song. We're going to say this word over and over again, Yeshua, Yeshua. That's just the name of Jesus. And if you're uh, wondering, how do I use worship as a weapon? The easiest way that you can do that is just to say the word Jesus. So don't be afraid of the devil. Don't be afraid of him being in your life. He's in your life. He's around your life. Let's, let's not beat around the bush about it. Instead, I want you to understand the authority that you have. You say the name of Jesus, and the devil is gone. That's all it takes. Just Jesus. When you say that, he flees. He's out. And we know that because in the New Testament, Jesus tells the disciples to go out and practice doing ministry. And they come back in and they say, well, there were a couple demons that we couldn't get rid of. We couldn't cast out. And Jesus says, do I have to do everything for you all the time? You've got to go in my name. You've got to speak the name of Jesus. It's that easy. So we have nothing to fear because you've got this guy, the devil, that wants to keep you from using worship as a weapon. But he's not strong enough and he doesn't have the authority enough to overcome the name of Jesus. So let's look at, I want to show you how worship is used as a weapon here. And what we read in 2 Chronicles here is exactly applicable to us today. Everything that we're about to read in this applies to us today. Just because you can't pronounce the names or just because it's in the Old Testament, it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply today. And this this worship, this weapon of worship applies today. So let's look here. 
So what you have is you have, again, you've got Israel, or you've got Judah. And Judah has a king, King Jehoshaphat. Now what's all around Judah is they are being laid siege. So they've got a bunch of different armies from a bunch of different nations that he'll tell us at the end of the scripture what is around Judah. And so what that means is that King Jehoshaphat and his people, they are looking out from their tents, from their camp, from their city, and they know that death and destruction is coming. To be in a place where you know that death and destruction is coming. That's where he was and that's where they are. And so as they're there, they're trying to consider how on earth are we going to get out of this situation. And they've just counted themselves dead. There's no way that they're going to win this war, win this battle. So you need to understand that it's a dead man walking that has an encounter with a prophet that unlocks the weapon that is worship. And so this prophet comes to King Jehoshaphat and God is speaking through prophets. And the prophet comes and he tells him, he said, listen carefully, all of you people of Judah, that's how we know who's there, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So this is the city and the greater group that is Judah. And King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So that's the first truth to understanding that worship is a weapon, is we got to understand that the battle is not actually ours to fight. If you can't figure out why you can't win the battle, it's because you're fighting a battle that's actually not yours to fight. We need to let go of those battles. See, if Jehoshaphat was going to fight that battle, then yes, he's absolutely dead. There's no way that they survive that. The first thing that God wants him to know is, Jehoshaphat, it's not your battle. It's mine. We need to give up some of our battles to God. We need to let some of that go. We need to stop trying to hold on to it, stop trying to fight it ourselves. And so Jehoshaphat, he says, okay, all right. So he's being told that the battle's not his to fight. You need not fight this battle. That's even more encouragement. Jehoshaphat, it's not yours, and you don't need to fight it. So remove yourself from the equation altogether. Take your positions and stand and witness the salvation. Everyone say salvation. Of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. I, I love this line here to think that God would tell them that. And I like to think, okay, God would tell me this at times as well. Do not fear or be dismayed. You know, when I tell my son, Benjamin, do, don't be afraid. It's okay. Don't fear. You don't have to worry about anything. It's not your battle. I'm fighting your battle for you. You know, to be a five-year-old and then lean into that safety and that security and that trust. You know, it's like our Heavenly Father is doing the same thing with us. Saying, Chris, don't fight that battle. I'll fight that for you. You don't even have to be a part of it. Because you're going to witness salvation here. Don't be afraid or dismayed. And he says, tomorrow you're going to go out against them. For the Lord is going to be with you. In verse 18, look how Jehoshaphat uh, responds to this. So he's just been told that they're not all going to perish. They're not all going to be conquered. He's had redemption. He's had salvation at the last minute of the last hour. He's heard that he's going to be saved, that his people, his city are going to be okay. And Jehoshaphat, look what he does. This is what he does. He bowed with his face to the ground. That's honor. What is worship? It's honor. It's adoration. So he bows with his face to the ground and all of Judah, not some, all. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fell down before the Lord as well, worshiping. Say worshiping. They fell down worshiping. God. Then the Levites, which were the priests, the Levites, they they were the sons of the Kohathites and the sons of the Korites, and they stood up to praise God. Say praise. They praised the Lord of Israel with a very loud voice. This wasn't like a like a meek little like Jesus, you know, yay God, you know, like the way some of you sing worship in here on Sunday mornings. Now they were they were going for it. But you know why they were going for it? You know the difference between when I stand up here and I sing worship, when this right here, you know, I, I, I'm trying to be in it and put all my all into it, but I forget that I was saved and that I was redeemed. I forget that I was on the edge of death and destruction. I forget that there was nothing in me or in my power or my ability to be able to bring salvation into my life. I was surrounded by an encampment of enemies and there was nothing that I could do about it. 
But Jehoshaphat has not forgotten that because it's new, it's fresh in him. And when you remember that you were saved and you remember what you were saved from, and when you see the army, when you see the the battle that's coming at you and you're scooped up at the last second and you're given salvation, then that's an impact. Now all of a sudden that person is singing with a loud voice because nothing else matters. I'm just going to worship God because I shouldn't even be here right now. And that's why they worshiped with a loud voice. And so then in verse 20, look what he does here. This is so great. In verse 20, they got up early in the morning and they went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe and trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe and trust. Worship God. Guys, we're going to worship. Believe and trust in his prophets. And we will succeed. The prophet is who is giving the message to them. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang. Everyone say sang. Who sang to the Lord and those who praised. Say praise. Praised him in their holy priestly attire as they went out before the army and said, Oh, hold on a second. Did you catch that? Because I I almost just missed it. They went out before the army. See, before the men with the horses and before the swords went out, before the shields went out, before the battle and the fight went out, what went first? Worship went first. Jehoshaphat knew that it wasn't his battle to fight, so he sent his praise team in front of the army. He didn't leave. It wasn't my battle. So guys, all my warriors, you're going to stay right back here. Instead, we're going to worship. And we sent the worship team out. And when he did that, look how God handled that there. They went out before the army and they said, Praise and give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. This is a man that's experienced salvation. He didn't experience salvation because they'd already won the battle. This battle's not won yet. He's experienced salvation because of what God has told him, what the prophets told him. And he believes it. And so then in verse 22, when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes. Against the sons, and these are all the people that were against them. The sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were struck down in defeat. It was God that ambushed them. And they struck each other down. And they defeated each other. And that happened because they worshipped. It happened because they led with worship. See, I'm going to introduce something to you now that we're going to use for the rest of this message here. But I want you to understand this here. See, when your worship goes up, your salvation comes down. See, when Jehoshaphat worshipped God, then salvation came. See, my job is to worship God. God brings the salvation. See, we like to think this is what salvation is. All right. So if I worship God, He's going to give me this for my salvation. But it may not be that way. See, Jehoshaphat worships God before they win the war. He knew that God said, don't fight this battle, it's not your battle. But he didn't know that he was going to live for another three days, five days, seven days. But he did his role, I worship. And he let God do his role, bring that salvation down. See, when, when I was dealing with all kinds of mess of depression and anxiety and, and uh, just depression like crazy, you know... I was, I was laying on the floor one day, and I was, you know, you're at the end of yourself. And when I say I was laying on the floor one day, I was like one of like 30. But I, I remember a couple specific moments in my, my journey with, with depression, my journey with suicide. I'm laying on the floor in the fetal position, and I'm just saying, God, where are you? So growing up in the church... Growing up a Christian, following God, I'm here because I'm a missionary at the time, you know, doing all of that. And then here I am in this moment just saying, God, bring me salvation. Which for me at the time meant that he would lift off of me all of this depression, all of this anxiety, all of this stuff. Guess what never came off of me is that. But instead, laying there, I never gave up. Even in the the weakest state that I was ever in, I never forgot that the name of Jesus was all that I needed. And so I would lay there and I would just say over and over and over again, just Jesus, just Jesus. 
and my worship went up, and salvation came down. And now Casey and I have a story, and God's used us, and He continues to use us, and we get to speak into the lives of others. And that salvation, when it came down, it wasn't what I thought it would look like, but that wasn't my job. Your job is not to define your salvation. Your job is simply to worship God. When you're staring at your army, when you're surrounded and you think death and defeat is unavoidable and it absolutely cannot uh, get any worse than it actually is, I just want you to remember your job is not to find salvation. Your job is to find your worship. Pick up your harp. Have you hung your harp on a tree? Have you forgotten your worship song? Find a song, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, whatever it is. Find something. Say, this is my fight song. This is going to be my worship song. This is going to be what I play. And go to it every day. Let your worship go up. And then watch how God brings salvation down. See, when Jehoshaphat put the worshipers and the praisers at the front, he was also doing something that was just so amazing about this weapon that is worship. You want to know something else that happens when you worship? Something really cool that happens when you worship, when you sing praise. See, praise births the presence of angels in the battle zone of your experiences. Let that sink in for a second. When you praise, when you praise God, it births the presence of angels. Those angels are messengers from God. Angel means messenger. And when you're praising God, then the angels are responding. Even the Holy Spirit says that it goes to the throne room of God and it mourns for you and on behalf of you. There there is a a greater power at work here that loves you, that cares for you, that's interceding for you. And when you lift your worship up and your praise up, not only does salvation come down, but God unleashes an army of angels into your life and into your experiences. But don't get me wrong, our role is not to define this. If you try and define this moment of salvation, this, what, what the, this angel army looks like in your life, then you're taking it out of God's hands, you're putting it in your hands, and all it's going to do is lead you to disappointment. You have such an easy role that we oftentimes try and overcomplicate it. Your role is to do one thing and one thing only, and that's worship. And that's it. And then salvation, that's God's job to do. I want to talk to you about a guy named Paul in Acts here. And I'm going to give you a bit of a setup here. Um, So Paul is a guy that he was at one point in time killing, murdering Christians, people that were following this thing called the way, uh, which was the the kind of the, the after Jesus died, the gospel movement here. And so Paul is going around making it his mission to kill these people. He has this experience with with Jesus, actually, on the road to Damascus. And Paul becomes the guy... That's taking the gospel message, which means that you were born a sinner. So if you've been in church a long time and you've heard the gospel, this is what it is. You're born a sinner. Jesus came and he died for you. If you accept him, your sins are forgiven. And then he rose from the grave three days later. And that's our ticket into heaven. That's the forgiveness of our sins. So grace and mercy and all of those things hinge directly on this message that is the gospel. So that's very different from the Jews who had like 900 rules. And so Paul was going around and making sure that everybody that was trying to follow this was, was punished. So God has an encounter with him. And then he starts taking that message to the very people that he was trying to persecute and to kill. And on this journey as a missionary, Paul picks up a guy named Timothy. And him and Timothy, the, you know, they, they're going to go on a mission trip. Where do you want to go, Timothy? Timothy's like, I don't know. Where do you want to go? Let's take the name of Jesus somewhere that has never been before. You know, thinking like, let's go to the most extreme thing that we can think of. It's, okay, let's go over to East Asia. You know, that was before COVID, right? And so he's, let's go over to, to there. It's still safe there. And so Paul, they try and go. And twice God says, no, 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 don't go that way. And they're like, well, but isn't this for a good reason? God says, no, <clears throat> don't go that way. Then, God has a, or then Paul has a dream. And in his dream, a man from Macedonia comes and says, Paul, we need the gospel here. So Paul wakes up immediately. They get on a boat, and they set sail, and they end up in uh, Philistia, which is where the church of Philistine, or the, the Philippian church is. So they're in Philippi. And so Paul's there. 
And immediately they see a convert and a woman named Lydia. And they're taking the gospel message out and people are coming to know him. And there isn't even a church established there. In fact, Paul's looking for the place where the believers, where the, 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 those that are following the gospel would get together and pray. And there is no place. So he goes outside the city walls, almost into the trash heap there, to find a place to pray. The place to meet, to congregate. And so while this is happening... People are coming to know Jesus. Lots of good stuff is happening. Paul's got this little annoyance that kind of starts to follow him around. It's a woman. It's not annoying because of that. But she was following. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a bad roll today. I need my wife here. Can we pray for our son Wyatt to stop being sick so that she could be here? No, so she, this, this woman was possessed by a demon. See, we talk about demons and devils again here. So God wants you, and Satan doesn't want you to, doesn't want God to have you. And so Satan's going to try and do whatever he can so that God can't have you. And so Satan had gotten a hold of this woman. And in her, there was this spirit of divination. So she was able to see into the future. And so she was possessed. And she was following Paul and Silas and Luke was there and Timothy was there following them around. And everywhere they went, she was proclaiming that these are men from God and they're here proclaiming the gospel message of Christ. Now that's true. She was telling the truth. But it was messing with Paul's ministry. It's like having somebody just yelling everywhere that you go. And Paul gets frustrated one day. And when he gets mad and frustrated, he turns around. And out of his frustration, he just says, you know, Satan or, or devil, demon, be gone. He casts the demon out. And it's gone. All of a sudden it left. And so now you've got... This woman who's been healed. But that creates a problem. And that's where we jump in here with this story. In Acts 16, verse 19 here. But when her owners saw that their hope of profit was gone. See, there's the priority. See, what, what I didn't tell you is that this lady, this woman, she was bringing money in for her owner. She was a slave. She was owned. She was owned by somebody. And she would use her power. She would use her spiritual power, her demonic power, whatever it was. She would use that in order to make money. So she would go out and people would pay her to hear their future. So she's making quite a bit of money here. And so when her owners realized that hope of her profit was gone, you know, if you really want to get to know somebody, you kind of get, you start digging around in their money and you really get to know what's going on there. And they seized Paul and Silas. And they dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace. This is where all the trials were, were held. And then when they joined in the attack, or when they had brought them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men who are Jews are throwing our city into confusion and causing trouble. I, I don't think they were throwing their city into confusion or causing trouble. I think that they were throwing their finances into confusion and causing trouble. I think that's really what was happening here. And so they had to put an end to this. And so Paul and Silas start troublemakers, healing people, setting people free, bringing deliverance, telling people about Jesus, causing real trouble. They're publicly teaching customs. This is what he's saying. Like They're teaching things that are unlawful for us Romans. They're unlawful for us to accept or to observe. And then the crowd, they join in. And they attack them. And the chief magistrates tore their robes. So Paul and Silas have their robes torn off of them. And when their robes are torn off of them, they were ordered to be beaten with rods. This isn't like a, a, a stick. This isn't the ruler that you went through you know, in school. This isn't, this isn't a, a tiny switch. This is a, this is a rod. This is not meant, to, uh, it's not meant to kind of hurt a little bit. It's meant to break your bones and, and bash your head in. And they are beaten severely. They're not done anything wrong. In fact, it's illegal for Paul to be treated like this. Because he's a Roman citizen, but they don't know that. And so, they're beaten with rods, and then after striking them many times with the rods, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. So here you are. <clears throat> you're doing God's work. You're doing a good thing. And you do a good thing for a person, and you're wrongfully arrested, wrongfully accused. You're wrongfully put in prison. You're wrongfully beaten, you've had your clothes torn off of you, you're naked, you're full of shame, now you're, who knows if you've got broken bones or broken ribs, and then you're being told to put into jail. And the jailer has a special job to make sure that no matter what, 
you don't get out of that. And in fact, it's so, it's, it, it's so, he's so serious about this that um, the jailer in the next verse, having received such a strict command, they threw him in the inner prison. So there's outer prison, inner prison. So now he gets put down into the dungeon. And he's fastened, their feet are fastened in stocks in an agonizing position. See, here's the thing about the stocks that I learned. You know, you think about someone sitting, you know, next to a, a like a, a stone wall and someone sitting there, you know, they're kind of holding their knees up against their chest and they've got chains on their ankles. That's not what it was like for them. So what they would do is they would put a rod in between your, your knees and they would contort your feet and contort your ankles in a way and then clasp them so that you were left in agonizing pain, an unceasing, unending, unrelenting amount of pain. And so here you have two people that are, that are in this situation. They found themselves here. So here's the question. Did Paul and Silas... Did they hang their harps? See, Paul and Silas had a worship song. They'd been singing it all around the world as they've been taking the gospel message out to a whole bunch of people. But did Paul and Silas hang their harps? See, they were left with the choice that I call midnight's choice. See, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. Let me contextualize this for your life a little bit for you here. You find yourself in a situation, friends with family, a situation you've created, a mental health situation, a physical situation. I don't know what it is for you. But there's probably a good amount of us that feel like that maybe we've been wrongfully accused, we've been wrongfully beaten, we've been put in shackles. So maybe that wrongfully beaten is where somebody is, real, is beating you down when you don't deserve it. Maybe the shackles are is guilt, maybe that's shame. But something has you in a constant position of agony. Something's got you in a constant position of pain. You thought you were doing the right thing. You thought life was, hey, I'm following God. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm a good person. Even if you're not following God, you know, you're not out, you know, uh, uh, being a bad person. You're, You're a good person. Why is this happening to you? And you find yourself with a choice at midnight. Because see, when life is hard, when things are difficult, when things hurt, when the prayers haven't been answered, when God hasn't shown up, when all of that stuff is happening, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that, it's, it's hard, but it's not so bad. Because at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you can go get a Coke Zero, you can get a bag of chips, you can watch a movie, you go have a lunch with somebody, hang out with some friends, come down here to Purpose Coffee during the week and have a cup of coffee, the best that you'll find around town. There's stuff that you can do, Right? But at midnight, it's you and you alone. Even if you're in the bed with somebody else, it's still you and you. And so that's your midnight choice. Because now you've got to actually deal with it. Because there's no distractions that are around. And in that moment with Paul and Silas, with their midnight choice, what should they do? Should they hang their harps? See, Israel hung their harps when they realized that the pain... And the hurt was so great that the worship was too lost. Paul and Silas are in jail. The pain and the hurt is so great, but is the worship lost? Now, they make a choice to say no, and them it's not lost. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What were they doing? They were worshiping. Out of this inner jail, this inner dungeon, comes the worship from Paul and from Silas. And I like to think that they know what worship is is all about. They know the power behind it. So I don't think that this was a quiet singing. I think that they were just going for it. And they were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. So they're at least loud enough for others to hear it. And then suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. See, when worship went up, salvation came down. You know, if you can't figure out why you can't get out of your prison, I felt like that there's been in my life a couple strongholds, a couple prisons over me that I've had a hard time getting out of and, and getting beyond. I felt like that there were things that were shackling me, things that were holding me back. 
past sins or the way you think about yourself or you know you convincing yourself or the devil convincing you that you're unsavable, you're unredeemable, that you're into captivity and the journey is too far for you to get out of captivity and get back into freedom. But that's all a lie because even the devil knows how strong and how powerful worship is. And when Paul and Silas used it, worship went up, salvation came down, the jails opened up, and the shackles fell off. If you want to find out how to get out of jail and how to get out of agony, let your worship go up. That's your job. It's not God's job. You worship. God brings his salvation. So they let their worship go up. The doors of their prison open. The shackles fall off. The agony starts to subside. And Paul and Silas, they take off and they sprint out of there, right? They say, we're out of here. You know, it's like watching a scary movie. I don't know why they don't just leave the house. There's the front door, but let's not go there. Let's go down in the basement, you know? Why do they do that? Just walk out the door. Well, then there would be no movie. So Paul and Silas... We worship you, God, because we understand that you have saved us and that we would never be saved on our own, and you've done it, so we worship you. And the doors open, and an earthquake happens, and the shackles break off, and there's relief, and it's probably dark, and they're they're in the dark. It's not like a well-lit place here. There's no ventilation. And, And when the dust starts to settle, they're sitting there, and they could leave, but they don't. Instead, the next thing that happens, because of this earthquake... The jailer wakes up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself. Because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. See, he was told that he was to watch the prisoners. And he was so afraid that he wouldn't do that well, that he put them in the inner dungeon. Because he knew if they get out, then I'm a dead man. And so when he sees the earthquake, and he sees the doors open... He takes the sword to end his life. But you hear Paul. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, for we are all here. See, salvation isn't always just for you. Because when worship goes up, salvation comes down. And when worship went up out of Paul and Silas' mouth, a jailer who thought that his life and his world was over, salvation would come down for him. See, Paul and Silas didn't sprint out of the jail because they did not have a preconceived idea of this is what salvation is. Instead, their idea was that, well, we're just going to worship God. And they just worshiped God, and then God worked out the salvation. And it wasn't just for them, it was for the jailer and for his entire family. And this jailer, he goes on, and and he has this, him and Paul and Silas, they have this talk, and he asks him, he says, what must I do to be saved? What do you think Paul and Silas would tell him? They'd say, jailer, when your worship goes up, salvation comes down. That's how you get saved. That's how you give your life to Jesus. That's how you get saved. When worship goes up, salvation comes down. You know, we, we all this morning have that option today. I don't know what prison you're in. I don't know what shackles are on you. I don't know how long your journey into captivity has been. I don't know uh, how far away you are from your old song, from your old worship. I don't know. I don't know where you are. But what I do know is that today, right now, over the next few minutes while we worship, you're going to have an opportunity to let your worship go up. And then we're going to let God do His part for you. So you're all welcome today to participate in the one thing that the devil doesn't want you to know is a weapon, and that's praise and worship. So I, I want to lead us in a prayer right now, a, a prayer of salvation. Just in case that there's somebody here in this room that you, you've, got, you've had no relationship with Jesus. I'd, hey, welcome. Glad you're here today. Or if you've been around for a while and you think, I really would like that relationship with Jesus. You know, the first thing that Jehoshaphat was told was, it's not your battle. And Part of understanding that it's not your battle is to know whose battle it is. And then to let God fight the battle for you. And step one in that is to make Him your Heavenly Father. To give your life to Him. And so we're gonna, let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And this is for those of you that don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Never given your life to Christ. 
In this prayer, I want you to just repeat after me. You can do it in your own head and your own heart here. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I am a sinner. I know my sins should separate me from you forever. I believe your son Jesus died for me. I accept his death as payment for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for giving the gift of Jesus so I could live with you in heaven. Come into my life and be my Savior and friend. In Jesus' name, amen.